Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran on this sixth Sunday in the, in the season of Easter as we gather under the theme, Remain in My Love. Last weekend, uh, we heard Jesus talk about him being the vine and you and I are the branches. And, and if we are connected to Christ and that connection remains firm, the, all the life and blessings that Christ has to give comes to us. He goes a step further this morning and says, now remain in that. Remain connected to me. Remain in my love. Let my love be in you and in your love be there for me. That sounds so cerebral, doesn't it? Love, what's, what's that mean? Well, this is what it means practically speaking, that when the love of Christ is, is there in our hearts, it powerfully moves and shapes attitudes, priorities in life, our actions and our words towards one another. And so doing Christ, our, our Lord this morning, uh, reigns in heaven and, and we are his people. His mercies, his love is new for us again today. And so what a joy to be in his house this Mother's Day to express our, our love to our Heavenly Father uh, just as well as we express our thanks to our earthly mothers. With that, may the Lord richly bless our worship of him this morning. We begin with an opening announcement today by, by Kathy Gates. Uh, she is, is the lead counselor at Tomorrow's Choice Family Resource Center, and she uh, wants to talk to us briefly about an opportunity for us to remain in Christ's love as we share that love with our Waukesha community. Kathy. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, and I want to wish all of you a happy Mother's Day, because though you may not be a mother, you may never be a mother, you had one. Therefore, happy. Be happy about that. And thank your mom today, if you can. It's a bittersweet day for many women at Tomorrow's Choice. It becomes very evident that sometimes this is the saddest day of the year for many women who have uh, not accepted the challenge to be a mother and have guilt about that. We do post-abortion counseling. Some mothers have suffered miscarriages. We do some grief counseling. Most of what we do is to help and assist them with their babies. We assist through diapers. We call that God's love. The Jesus love never stops, and the giving of diapers never stops. Last, the beginning of this year, the statistics I wanted to share with you, in the month of January, we had over 160 clients that we saw and assisted. In February, that number rose a little bit to 170. In the month of March, 189, which we all kind of laughed about because I've always told all the clients, the first part of the year, we never have very many people come because Christmas they were taken care of by all the other agencies in town, so don't expect to have a lot of people. I think this is the most clients we've had at the beginning of the year, which means something's doing right. And what is it? It's sharing the love of God through our gifts and assistance. And not only are you helping us through your gifts that you give us, you're also helping people that are thousands, thousands of miles away from us. This became very evident on Saturday morning. Some of you may remember last year I told you the story about one of our clients that had immigrated from Russia, the young Turkish mom and her sister and her family were still living in uh, about an hour's hour west of Donetsk. And if that name is familiar, you might have read about in the paper. That's kind of the center of the fighting in Russia and Ukraine. She lives, she still lives there. And we met her yesterday through Skype. What fun. She and her four children are currently at the hospital. They've been there for almost two weeks getting treatment for a skin disease, which I wish I could tell you what it was. But we haven't figured out how to translate that disease into English where someone could understand it. But we got to see her little three-year-old daughter who waved at us and blew us kisses from her hospital room with her mom sitting on her mom's lap. We met her two other siblings. And the one that you might have remembered hearing about the boy who wanted a bicycle before he died because the Russian tank sitting right next to his house frightened him tremendously. That little boy is still alive. Nobody died. We thank the Lord for that. Uh, he was away getting treatment that day. But they're waiting right now. They are in the process of the lottery. The lottery in Ukraine means you don't get money. It means you get something better. You get freedom. You get passage, courtesy of the government, to come here. And her sister is hoping and praying that she wins the lottery this year. And I hope she does, too. 
Her sister that, has, that we've befriended and helped said, the first place she's taken her is tomorrow's choice so she can see how wonderful the Americans are and how much they love you and how they help take care of you. So how you can help us today, we're having our baby program again. Some of you may be familiar with this. This is the bottle. If you want to participate, that's fine. If you don't want to, it's okay to say no. They're not going to hand these to you. You have to ask for, ask for them. If you'd rather just get an envelope and put something in there, that's also back there. But I wanted to thank you for helping us have our ministry for the past 19 years. Without the help of our congregations and our friends, we don't exist and we are unable to continue showing people the love of Christ through diapers and clothing and through our friendship, one Christian to another. So today we rejoice. This is the day the Lord has made. Sing loud and thank the Lord for his love. Thank you, Kathy. Please stand. We worship at the top of page three of your bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of God, our Heavenly Father, to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hand to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. Oh, come, let us worship him. Let us kneel and bow down before him. Let us confess our sins with penitent hearts and obtain forgiveness by his infinite grace and mercy. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed the devices and desires of our hearts. We have offended against your holy law. We have done those things which we should not have done, and we have not done those things which we should have done. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Spare us and restore us according to the promises you have declared to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. For his sake, grant that we may live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. The almighty and merciful God, Lord, has granted us pardon and forgiveness of all our sins, grace for true repentance, an amendment of life, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. We sing the opening hymn, hymn number 365.
Please stand. Oh, Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. The Lord is risen. Let us worship him. Please be seated. The first lesson appointed for this Sunday, Mother's Day, also known as the sixth Sunday of Easter, is recorded for us in the New Testament book of Acts, reading from Acts chapter 11, beginning at verse 19. This will also be the foundation for the sermon you're going to be hearing in just a few minutes in our reading we hear how the first Christians share the love of Jesus, not only with each other, but with those outside their group. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. This is the word of the Lord. I now invite you to sing the entire psalm of the day, Psalm 98, on page 6 of your bulletin.
The second lesson appointed for today as we remain in God's love is recorded for us in the book of New Testament, book of 1 John, reading from chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one, the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Whoever loves me will keep my word, says the Lord. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for today is recorded for us in John chapter 15, beginning at verse 9. Jesus talks about remaining in his love. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command love each other. The Gospel of the Lord. Be Please be seated. We continue our worship as we sing the hymn of the day, hymn number 377.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. This Mother's Day weekend, I'm going to guess that many of us here today will spend at least some time flipping through the old family albums. I love seeing these old pictures of my grandma and grandpa Lee, my grandpa a sergeant in his uniform in World War II. My grandma Lee, our family Rosie the Riveter, who worked on the line at the Autolite factory in Bay City during the war years. There's my grandpa in uniform and my grandmother in her bride dress, so young, with all of life out there before them. One wonders, did they, did they know what was coming? Children, grandchildren, blessings upon blessings, and a young death with my grandpa at age 57. I turn the page, and, and there are the pictures of my mom, the, the captain of the high school synchronized swimming team for graduation from nursing school, wedding pictures, taking babies home from the hospital. And I really love those, those pictures of the babies and the toddlers and their terrible twos when you look at those little faces and you can already see their distinctive features, what one day they would grow up and grow into. Well, this morning we are not going to spend any time looking at the Christie family picture album, but we are going to spend some time looking at our Christian family picture album. What we look at this morning is, is pure history, and the history buffs among us can't wait, but, but those that don't like their history think, wow, boring. But I say, think again. Because when we look at the pictures of Acts chapter 11, you and I are privileged to take a peek at grandma and grandpa when they were young. And when we look at those pictures in Acts chapter 11, we are seeing the church in its infancy with those distinctive features that one day would grow up and grow throughout the world. So this morning, find a comfortable pew, and just for a moment, let's flip through the photos in the church's family album. We're going to see a sad picture of persecution, but then heartwarming pictures of proclamation and perseverance. The first picture in the family picture album is a difficult one to look at. It's, it's perhaps even more sad than the pictures that one of my confirmation students one bro once brought to me when she brought pictures from her grandpa who was an army photographer in World War II and he was there when our U.S. Army had freed the German concentration camp of Ordruf, Germany. And in those old black and white pictures of emaciated faces and sunken eyes, you were able to see Satan's unlimited appetite for death and destruction. And so too it was in that picture of the early Christian church. Satan could not keep Jesus body in a tomb. And so he was doing his best to dig a mass grave to put those into it who love the Lord Jesus. Listen. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. The first great wave of, of persecution hit the church like the shock waves of a terrorist bomb. We, we hear of the details a little earlier in the book of Acts. Saul was there giving approval to Stephen's death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Headhunting. Prison. 
Moms and dads dragged out of their homes in front of their children's eyes, many of whom were never seen again. Stephen is murdered, killed, martyred because of his Christian faith. And what was his great crime? One, he made sure that the old women in the Christian congregation didn't starve to death. And two, he pointed out the hypocrisy of Jerusalem's religious elite. Love for his fellow man and love for the truth of God's word made him worthy of death in Saul's sight. And that picture could have been taken yesterday. From the sands of Sudan, where our brothers and sisters in the faith are still sold into slavery. To the shoreline of the Mediterranean Sea, where ISIS loves putting Christians to death by cutting their heads off. To the jungles of Indonesia, where Christian churches are, are burnt to the ground like, like last week's garbage. To, to Syria, where, where thousands of Christians have been killed and driven from their homes just this last year. To the dad that has skipped over for a promotion at work because he's simply a, a little too honest for the boss's liking. To the mom who's on the outs with the neighborhood playgroup because she loves church just a little too much. To the teenager that is the butt of many a behind-the-back comment at school. All of it is, is proof of what Martin Luther once said when he said that if they crown Jesus with thorns, don't expect the enemies of Jesus to crown us with roses. That's not in persecution's picture. But as we look at that picture, we're also amazed. Persecution didn't spell the death of the church. Instead, miraculously, graciously, the Lord took the world's worst and made it into something good for the gospel. The ancient church father Tertullian said this, Christian blood is seed. When Christians in the book of Acts were driven from their homes, what did they take with them? The shirt on their backs and something else. Those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch telling the message only to Jews. That is what we hear earlier in Acts chapter 8. Those who had been scattered preach the word wherever they went. How stunning are the plans of God Almighty to take ruthless persecution and with it inspire relentless proclamation. The next picture, some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. How awesome is the Lord? Did you catch what you just saw in that picture? That the Lord took the very man that was a ringleader for persecuting the Christians and driving them out of their homes for safety in Antioch, and then ten years later makes that very man their pastor in the city of Antioch. Saul, now named Paul. 
To make matters more interesting, for the first time ever we hear of Jewish Christians rolling up their sleeves and proclaiming the good news to Greeks, bona fide heathen, welcome to the birth of real mission work in the book of Acts. A pastor by the name of Barnabas is there to encourage God's people, but he needed help, and so he went to Tarsus and got Saul. And for a whole year, they taught great numbers of people, and that great number of people went out and proclaimed the good news to many, many more people. And the gospel has been on the grow and on the go down to this very night, this very day. But there's an interesting little detail in that proclamation picture we need to take a look at. And that little detail is this, that the Jewish Christians at first only proclaimed the good news to fellow Jews. Are we ever tempted to be kind of like that, to share the good news with people that are sort of like us? Honestly, who are you more inclined to share your faith with? with? With the lady that has blonde hair and blue eyes and straight teeth and, and drives a nice car and has got a good family and the children are well behaved, they'll fit in well here at Trinity. Or are you more inclined to share the good news with the man in Milwaukee who has no home, doesn't bathe nearly enough, really can't read much is pretty much a speed bump in the sidewalks of the near north side what do you think are, are we more inclined to share the good news of Jesus with the soccer moms of Brookfield or the Muslim moms of Mozambique I asked the question and I have a hunch that I know the answer and there's an easy temptation to fall into there, to think that we're so comfortable with people like us that we simply assume that there will be someone like them to share the good news of Jesus with them someday. But brothers and sisters, when we look at that picture in the book of Acts, when we look at the history of the church, that's precisely how the Spirit of God doesn't work. Jews eventually preached to Greeks. And Greeks preached to Romans, and Romans preached to those who lived in Britannia, Great Britain. The gospel then grew arms and swam across the English Channel and came to the soil of the motherland Germany. And we just sang hymn number 377, written by a German by the name of Martin Luther. And he's still preaching the gospel to us. And, and I just have a hunch that the Lord will bless us with great joy, brothers and sisters, as we German-Americans of Trinity Lutheran proclaim the gospel to the Hispanic community of Waukesha. Who could have ever seen any of that coming? The gospel has gone out to the world. And in turn, the world has come to Waukesha. In miracle of miracles, the gospel has also gone out to you. By birth, we had better chances of growing wings and flying than we did coming to faith in Jesus, dead in sin, blind to truth, hostile to God. But God changed all of that. For me, he, he changed my life when he took a sinful pastor by the hand and baptized me in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he didn't send a pastor by the name of Barnabas to me. Instead, he sent me a good old school Wisconsin Synod pastor by the name of John F. Brenner to preach to me. And he didn't send a St. Paul to, to teach me school, but the first year I went to Lutheran school, in the second grade, there was a dear, friendly woman by the name of Sue Bugby, who was my first Lutheran teacher. And the Lord hasn't sent me to, to Antioch to encourage them to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts, but, but the Lord has sent me and Pastor O and Pastor Gates and, and our staff and faculty here to encourage you in the good news. 
Who are the faces in your life's album that you thank God for? Faces that taught you your prayers and taught you your Bible and sang Jesus songs to you and taught you the way of truth. Who are those faces? And know for certain that the Lord would love to use your face, your picture, in someone else's album of life. Truly, as we consider Jesus' blessings today, forgiveness for all of our sin, and that in Jesus he's graciously given us everything that we need for real living, you and I can be supremely confident as we go out and proclaim the Lord Jesus to our day, to our age, because this is true. Where there is a church of people who are passionate about proclaiming Jesus, there you will find a group of believers that perseveres in the face of all that Satan offers up. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Preaching, encouraging, teaching, encouraging. Translation, a church is only as good as its doctrine, as its teaching. Teaching that is, is biblically based, consistently taught, passionately believed. Think of what that, that biblical proclamation enabled to happen there in the city of Antioch, in this, in this pagan city of a half million people, upsprings a brand new Christian church, a Christian community that became the epicenter for bringing the good news out to the highways and byways of the world. It was from Antioch that St. Paul was sent out on all of his missionary journeys throughout the New Testament. Antioch became a powerhouse for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ in the ancient world. We even hear that it was at Antioch, this pagan city, that Christians were first called Christians. And now for the rest of the story. Good luck finding a Christian in Antioch today. Antioch today is a city of a couple thousand in the midst of a terrorist state by the name of Syria. And at some point in their history, Antioch simply began to assume that the gospel was their personal property and, and no longer held on to biblical teaching with the death grip for life. Instead, Christianity became sort of part of their culture. And eventually, when Muslim invaders did come, that Christian church collapsed like a house of cards. Here we are in modern-day Waukesha. Biblical preaching and teaching is still, still sounding from your pulpit and, and from your classrooms. And I pray to God that that biblical preaching and, and teaching is passionately believed. But I also pray for something else this Mother's Day morning. That the Lord would bless each and every one of us today with a wholesome fear of a lukewarm faith, of an armchair Christianity. You know that, that kind of thought that says doctrine is, is no longer a, a matter of biblical truth. It's, it's about nitpicking for theologians. And, and instead of passionately preaching and teaching and, and sacrificing to make it happen and, and hanging on to the scriptures for dear life, we'll, we'll instead, well, we'll instead, we'll sort of pray and maybe pay and perhaps obey. And soon the Christian faith becomes just another life choice instead of a matter of life and death. 
another hobby instead of stepping into the presence of the Almighty. And soon Christianity becomes a shallow culture which is the last stop before Christianity dies in any given place. Could that ever happen in Waukesha? Why is it, do you think, that here in the Lutheran heartland, the upper Midwest, that I, I talk to mission pastors around our synod down in, in places like Georgia and Alabama and Arizona and, and California, and that all my brothers in those places have the same stories about members that will drive an hour one way in order to get to their Lutheran services. But here in the zip code of the Wisconsin Synod headquarters, 10 minutes getting to church might as well be 10 hours. Why is it that in those outlying areas of our country, church attendance is 10 to 12 percent more in those churches than it is in the big old mama churches of the Lutheran heartland? Or why is it that missionaries will tell us that, that Christian churches of all flavors are absolutely booming in places like China, in India, in Africa, but, but here in Wisconsin we rejoice if we didn't get smaller last year? What do you think, brothers and sisters? Are we Antioch in her prime or Antioch in her decline? And know for certain that the answer to that question is found in every individual heart, thought, and priority here this morning. And so it's time to take a look at the big picture. You want the big picture for today? Take a look at this. Every time God's word is preached, God blesses it. Every time God's word is, is heard and received in faith, God blesses it. God's blessed you with an open heart to hear and, and believe the message. And my prayer is that Jesus would bless you all with the eyes of Christ to see the harvest that's waiting out there in the fields, ready to be brought in. And that he'd keep on blessing you with, with the backbone of Christ to never ever sell out to shallow compromise with the world, but to stand up as loving ambassadors, proclaimers of truth in our day and in our age. Remember that someday the great-grandchildren will be looking at the family album. And when they do, they will see wonderful pictures of the great-grandparents of the faith in Antioch so many years ago. But our story is still being written. What will they see on Trinity's page? A hundred years from now. Well, with the forgiveness of Jesus covering every single sin of our past, and with the Lord Jesus in his power present with us right here, right now, where two or three hundred are gathered in his name, and with our future already well in his hand. I have a feeling that that picture will be positively pretty. May the Lord's hand be with us and upon us, and God grant that his hand remain with us. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. In response to God's word this morning, we will conclude Luther's hymn, stanzas 6 through 10, hymn 377.
You may be seated. Two quick announcements this morning. One is uh, an opportunity to remain in Jesus' love and put that love to work along the lines of the sermon. For the third summer, we are going to be hosting a booth uh, down at Frame Park for Fiesta Waukesha. Um, it's kind of an outreach to our Hispanic neighbors here on, in the White Rock community. Uh, that will be June 13th to 14th. Uh, we are in need of volunteers. What you don't need to know is Spanish. We'll have people that will take care of that. Uh, what you do need to do is be able to hand out literature, shake a hand and smile, and uh, welcome people to hear more about the Lord Jesus through your ministry here at Trinity. And then here at church on Thursday night, 40 days after Easter, is probably my favorite day, day of the year, including Christmas and Easter, by the way. It is the Festival of Ascension, also called, what, there's church tonight? Yes. Thursday evening at 6.30, uh, we will celebrate our Lord's uh, victory parade, his heavenly homecoming. I'd give you this thought. We by the hundreds and thousands celebrate when Jesus came to heaven, from heaven to earth, in humility. Why in the world not roll up our sleeves and rejoice this Thursday evening when he ascends, not in humility, but in all glory as our King of kings and Lord of lords. We will have a wonderful service for you this Thursday night, I promise, at 6.30. With that, we'll now gather our gifts of love to the Lord. Do take a moment with the friendship registers in the pews. Hello, I'm Pastor Randy Hunter, the Chairman of the Commission on Adult Discipleship. As Christians, we're lifelong learners. There's great joy in coming to a deeper understanding of God's Word. Today, two exciting new ways to grow in our faith from Wells Adult Discipleship. Hi everybody, welcome back to our final week of our interactive faith Bible study on the book of Judges. On nearly 10,000 computer screens and iPads around the world, Lay people are participating in a six-week Bible study from Pastor David Scharf. This Bible study is definitely meant to be a, a supplement to the already strong program at a congregation. Just one more option to, to get people into the Word. And then they were able to come back. And this online session is produced at Pastor Scharf's home congregation in Greenville, Wisconsin, and is available for live viewing anywhere in the world. That's actually how the King James Version translates it. And the thought is that Samson was doing like a martial arts move where he like thrust his, his knee into the, the other person, grabbed them by their right arm, flung them over his head. The semi-annual Bible studies are led by Wells pastors and professors who have developed certain expertises or excellence on a subject. The studies include graphics, maps, discussion questions, and especially significant, a chat feature where viewers can interact online during the sessions to exchange ideas and ask questions. The chat function uh, works really well. We have a moderator. She always lets me know if there's something really interesting coming across that I really need to respond to. Missing the live broadcast is not a problem because all the studies are archived for viewing anytime. Once we're through this session, we plan to go back and watch the episodes from even years previous to that. So we're really excited about that. I have gone back to the archive sections and, and watched them almost like a, a binge watching approach, right? And um, what I like to do is go and see what the discussion was if I had to miss the class. Our strength comes from God's word and the more we're in God's word, the stronger our faith come, becomes and the, the better we're able to live life. A number of different teachers and courses are available. Anyone can view and participate. You can find past Bible studies at the wells.net website. The next interactive faith Bible study will begin in September and will help you learn from the prophet Elisha. The internet can connect us to millions, but this next story is about connecting to just one, 
that one special person God has given many of you, your spouse. All the people in this room have given up their Saturday because they recognize there's something much more important in their lives, their marriage. This is a Wells Marriage Enrichment Weekend, one of many held all across the country each year. What else have you found valuable for devotion time? I think that life has a whole lot of distractions. And when we come here, it's a focus on each other, a focus on our relationship, and um, that it's centralized on our faith. It takes three to make a marriage work. Uh, God is a very important part of it, and that's why we come to these events, and we learn how it fits into our lives and, and how to take time in our busy lives to make time for things like this and to grow in our faith. What did you discover? Benefits of a friend. The topics at these weekends vary from year to year and place to place. But one thing stays the same. The focus is on understanding marriage in light of the gospel. We bring to the table a different kind of marriage enrichment resource. This is about Jesus' love for us. This is about the gospel of Jesus and then the difference it makes in our marriage. It's also for young people like us who are students and who are just, you know, trying to start off on the right foot with a marriage. It's just helping us build our own strong family and be an asset to our community. Goes a long way. Grab hands and pray about it. It does help. With our culture pulling marriages apart, it's a blessing to have resources like this, strengthening marriages as God intended. Wells Adult Discipleship offers marriage enrichment weekends in locations all over the country. Check the Wells website, wells.net, for the one near you. Please stand for prayer. We begin our prayers at the top of page 9 in your bulletins as we say the offering prayer together. We pray. Lord, tis not that I did choose you, that I know could never be, for this heart would still refuse you, had your grace not chosen me. You removed the sin that stained me, cleansing me to be your own. For this purpose you ordained me, that I live for you alone. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Dear Father in heaven, your love is manifest in your providence and in the saving work of your Son. By your Spirit, you manifest our love with deeds. We pray for our leaders, lawmakers, and justices. We pray for all who are sick in body or mind, and all those we name in our hearts. Lord, give them courage and faith, comfort and healing according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father. As we observe Mother's Day this weekend, we give thanks for mothers and all those who nurture us. We pray that you would give them the resources to provide for all God's children, to raise them up to know and serve you in godly lives. We praise you, God, for establishing the family as the basic building block of our society. On this Mother's Day weekend, we thank you especially for Christian moms who taught us the truths of the Holy Bible by their words and deeds. We also pray for those who are separated from their mothers by distance or death, as well as for those who would like to have families of their own but struggle with the silent pain of infertility. Assure them of your constant care and protection 
and help them to see your gracious hand in their lives. Lord of Life, thank you for blessing Jason and Jacqueline Shearer with the gift of a baby girl, Emmeline Shearer, born this past Tuesday. Thank you for protecting both mother and daughter and keeping them safe during delivery. Now bless the Shearers as they raise their daughter in the training and instruction of the Lord Jesus. Remind every one of us that all children are a blessing from you alone. Help us keep our families, children and grandchildren, close to Christ all their days. We pray for Phil Bolhagen, who experienced a minor stroke, and for Joyce Plain, who is hospitalized in serious condition in the ICU unit. Will Lord be their shield and great reward? If it is according to your divine plan, protect them and restore them to health in your perfect time and will. Send an extra measure of your spirit to give them confidence that your ways are best and deepen their faith. We thank you on behalf of Ted Ortel, who had sp a spinal procedure this past week. Thank you for protecting his life and blessing the medical efforts of his doctors and nurses. Continue to help him heal and be with him. As the district presidents meet to assign calls to the graduates of Martin Luther College and Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, give them godly wisdom that comes from above. Lead them to assign men and women who will zealously take the good news of Jesus to the pulpits, classrooms, streets, and homes that more souls might know the saving truths of Christ Jesus. We pray for those students who receive Bibles and catechisms in the first service this morning. As they receive your word from our congregation, bless them as they read the scriptures. Open their minds to see the wonders of your grace, and may they take these biblical truths and apply them to their daily lives. O Lord of life and death, we thank you for the mercies which you have blessed our fellow believer, Joan Marzacco, now fallen asleep. Thank you for especially brought her to the knowledge of Jesus. We ask that you would comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Hear us, Lord, now, as we bring you our private petitions. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Oh. 